like it would it it would <clears throat> release a single. Oh, I don't believe it. He's here. Ahmed, well, welcome. Ahmed, how's it going? Hey, hello. Hi. It's nice to so, meet you. Yes. So I, what I was telling uh, everyone here is the way I usually run these is the first thing I do is I try to get people's impressions going down the line. And um, but since you were the other person in the debate, <clears throat> I am willing to skip over Nestlig as going next and let you go next. Sorry, Nestlig, but, you know, the other guy from the de debate is sort of important in that debate after show. So um, I, I, did, I didn't have much interesting to say. Uh, OK, <laughs> well, um, so TD Link, did you have any more that you wanted to add about your take on the debate before we let uh, Ahmed here go? Uh, not really. OK, so Ahmed, uh, let us know your first impression. Um, about about the debate, how do you think it went? Been... What do you think you could have done better? What do you think I, I should have done better? Any of that stuff. Well, I, I think I think the topic is, is is a very big one. I think we um, got a little bit stuck on some um, subtopics, but I think those subtopics deserve uh, a whole discussion um, of 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 their own. Um, yeah, I, can I agree. think the theory has yeah plenty. There's plenty, plenty, plenty of equivocation in this theory. So, um, for example, when when you did your opening remarks, you you, you talked about dissent. Nobody will say dissent is not there. You know? Uh, when there is, uh, you know, change, there is change, there is diversity. These are the, 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 the whole thing, the, the whole matter is interpretation. And the data and the evidence and the facts are the same. So when you go into any specific um, topic, there are so much details. Uh, we can spend uh, two or three uh, <laughs> episodes on, 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 on endosymbiosis or multicellularity or... Uh, I'd know, be okay with that, by the way. prokaryotes are changed. Yeah, I would also so I think this is interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that there are definitely people here who are myself included who are willing to go into multi part discussions with you on on those topics, because um, I think, like Steve said, while we might have some serious disagreements, uh, you are someone who has shown himself able to have a, 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 you know, a polite and respectful discussion, which is actually surprisingly rare when it comes to anti-evolutionists so um, well, to, be fair, to be fair you are on the internet so mm. well yeah in person mm. most anti-evolutionists i know aren't the sort of vitriolic types that you get out of things like you know like nephilim free or uh the egg john maddox um can actually can um well uh would i would am i allowed to, uh, to ask him a question I mean, yeah. Go for um, it. Well, uh, first, I, I do want to ask because we we talked about this off air. Um, Ahmed, would would you be interested in? Because you mentioned the Cameron explosion multiple times during your debate, um, and I, yeah. that's actually a topic. That that's actually a topic that I've done um, a substantial amount of research on. So, if you would be oh, interested, yeah. quite a bit a few times, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. As, as Nestle know, well knows, yeah. Um, so. If you would be interested, I'd be interested in having a debate with you on the nature of the Cameron explosion and whether it was an evolutionary event or a creation event. Right. Um, if you're um, if you're interested, fine. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you see, the, okay. The, the thing the thing is, um, all all of those topics um, have this very interesting feature. It is that um, you you look at the data. And, and you do uh, some research on it. And, and, and what I have personally observed is that if you go level one of research, you reach conclusion A. If you do level B, you reach uh, conclusion B. But if you go to level three, you are back to conclusion A. So there is, there is this kind of tricks in nature that, 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 that really needs one to go pretty deep. So if you have gone uh, real deep in the research, that will be really fun because uh, maybe one of us changes his mind. <laughs> well, I can tell you, yeah. I, I did in fact change my mind. Um, you, you probably don't know this, but I actually do have a series of uh, videos that I do called uh, Leaving, it's usually Leaving Young Earth Creationism. I have had a Leaving Old Earth Creationism, but um, the first episode was me, but since then it's just been um, me uh, interviewing people who have actually changed from being anti-evolutionists 
to no longer being anti-evolutionists. In fact, I am working on setting mm. one up, uh, hopefully, either a week from today or two weeks from today. So this is a topic that right. I, a lot of people do change their mind on. It's just that I find they tend not to go the direction you would prefer them to. You mean the evolution topic or the Cambrian explosion topic? <clears throat> evolution in general. Um, I know a lot of people... Ah. I know of a yeah. lot of people who were demonstrably uh, young Earth creationists, and in many cases fairly well-informed about uh, creationism in, in general and its arguments, and who are now uh, no longer that. But the people who claim to have gone the other way, I tend to find are woefully bad in their understanding of evolutionary theory, to the point that I doubt they were ever really well-informed about evolution. I'm sure there are some exceptions, but um, actually I do know of a couple exceptions, but not very many. So I do think the trend tends to be that the more research you do, the more likely okay. you are to end on uh, universal common ancestry and biological evolution. But, uh, okay, we'll disagree on that, but uh, let's take it further. Um, I do want to make sure that Nestle gets in with his first oh, impressions. Yeah. So let's make sure we get that. Well, I, I didn't watch the debate from the beginning. I, I didn't watch the openings, for example. Ooh. I did watch the uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I did watch the second half, and I think both like were great. Of course, I, I agree more with that, but, but I think both with being uh, polite and not okay. interrupting as such were great. Although I I did find Steve uh, was too much involved for my taste. Steve does tend I, to take a. By the end of it, Steve was reasonably actively involved, and um, I. I don't know. I, look, I see the value in multiple different um, moderation styles, and I'm perfectly open to having um, a variety of moderators in my mm -hmm. um, debates. You know, like so, I've had uh, I've had Erica Guts at Gibbon moderate for me. I've had James moderate for me. I've had Praise I Am that I Am the Creationist moderate for me. I've had Steve moderate for me. I've had uh, Maya, one of my subscribers, moderate for me. So you know, I'm definitely someone who thinks that it's good to have a, a bit of a variety in there because. There's something to be said for the sort of hands-off approach in some cases, like um, like James might have. Um, <clears throat> but I do think that sometimes there is some reason to have a more active uh, approach in the sense the, uh, that Steve might have. Um, I, I mean, I definitely have things that in that I do... I would have had... If it had been up to me, I would have had Steve do things a little bit differently. But then again, that's true for every moderator I've ever had, so... Yeah, I, I think there are valid criticisms to make of Steve's moderation, uh, and I also think that there are genuine positives to his moderation style. Um, um, I have a little input here. Uh, actually, I, I think uh, the main success of this one, if, if we count it as a success, is that we didn't have a specific structure other than the opening and the discussion. But I think the good thing is that for the majority of it, you know, we didn't, you know, like jump... Uh, yeah. over each other's times and uh, interrupt and uh, it didn't it didn't go into a you know a screaming context yeah context, well <laughs> so honestly it it you know? the, the reason i like that format is it is it's basically a litmus test for every time i first interact with someone in this kind of setting if they can follow that format without it becoming just a horrible screaming match that means it's someone who's worth my time to talk to and there are people who i've already said nope you cannot do this so it's not even worth bothering with you. Um, so, like, for instance, um, uh, there was a, a guy I uh, debated called Mr. Batman. There's no value in ever talking to Mr. Batman. Um, because he, it, given that kind of format, he was incapable of staying on topic, even vaguely. And he just became rude very quickly. And so that's why I'm, I'm done with him. He's not worth my time. But you are someone who, while we disagree, I have always had um, good interactions with. In fact, uh, people probably don't know, but we were talking fairly extensively on Facebook uh, in like, yes. you know, the, the messenger. And yeah. the whole time, I thought that you were always having, you know, interesting responses. And we even chatted about stuff that's, that's off topic to this. Like we talked about, you know, um, what would you recommend as the, the order to read the Quran in if someone has never approached it before? And so we had a discussion about that that was completely not to do with this. And so, you know, yeah. I, I appreciate that, that we have managed to have a lot of very cordial interaction, which is why I am more than willing to go deeper into some of the topics that were brought up. Like, I would be willing to have a, a discussion 
just about endosymbiosis. Um, let me take a look at my notes. Um, yeah. If you want to have a, a talk about things like um, <clears throat> uh, the ancestry of modern animals through the fossil record, you know, tracing transitional fossils and stuff, that would be another great uh, discussion to have. Um, if you want to bring up things like uh, genetic algorithms and um, whether they can or cannot be used as sort of a, an analogy for biological evolution, I, I would be willing to have that discussion. I think any of those would be great. Like Jackson said, uh, we could set up something about the Cambrian explosion. So yeah, I, I think that you are someone who is definitely worth having more conversations with. I enjoy talking to you. Thank you. So either the Cambrian explosion or even the matter of this, uh, you know, fossil or lineage through the fossil record, I think they're very, very interesting topics. I was actually having a huge discussion for the last seven days about this matter of the completeness of the fossil record and tracing mammals back to, you know, unicellular life. And uh, I've been having some discussions with some evolutionary biologists that, you know, uh, I would really uh, have discussions with you rather than because, you know, they get so nervous. And it's like we're fighting and, and, and they would immediately jump at you if you do not accept it, it's because you do not understand it. But yeah, it, it doesn't have to be this way. Well, plus most, um, most actual scientists in the field are too busy, busy to have these conversations. That's why most of the people who have yeah. them are either doing it as a hobby or are um, not actually professionals in the field. Like, I'm not a professional researcher in anything. The closest I've ever come is when I was doing my, getting my degree. And I did have to do some original research. In fact, in some cases, well, quite a bit. But yeah, they're prof professor of internet with a PhD in uh, Google research. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I, it's, I would, um... it's amazing how much information is available for those who would like to find the information. Just yeah, of I... you're you're absolutely correct on that. Um, like, I, I would be interested in having the conversation on the Cambrian because, uh, well, for instance, you made the claim that, that most of these organisms appear in like a seven to 10 million year period uh, when that, that's not accurate. For instance, the camera yeah, explosion was over up a period yeah. of like 25 million years. Yeah, because at the, the, at the very least, at the, yeah. yeah, at the very least, because the oh, base oh, oh, oh. of the, of okay. the Adabanian was revised over, yeah. over the last like two decades. So the length of time that the camera explosion in like the extremely narrow paleontological sense has occurred was at least 25 million years. Uh, also, like the like the exact cutoff between where it begins and where it ends is like arbitrary. Like, like yes, absolutely. Where, where, yeah. Wherever you put the line, there's always interesting stuff happening before. There's well, always interesting stuff happening <clears throat> after. If you if you guys want, I mean, I'm okay with you having yeah. an informal discussion with the understanding that you know yeah. no one really prepared for this. So, if you guys want it, like Jackson, if you want to give like a quick overview of why you think the Cambrian explosion is not. Um, something that's exceptional or unexpected evolutionary in terms of evolution, I, I'd be okay with that. And then if Ahmad is okay with it and he wants to give his take on why he finds your explanation either convincing or not, does that sound like something you guys would be okay with? Yeah. I'm okay with that. All yeah. Right. Um, I'm not going to super well, time it. Just don't ramble. Okay, <laughs> sure. Yeah, um, well, my... Um, the the problem with the Cameron explosion in in a nutshell is that the the by and large the public perception of it was that this is an event that occurred like like you know immediately which they, is an explosion explosions happen very quickly and part of the reason for this is you had very popular books in the eighties in the late eighties like uh, Stephen Jay Gould's work Wonderful Life which kind of makes it seem as though uh, based on the fossil record that they had at the time, it seemed like you had a whole huge burst of diversity essentially out of nowhere because they had no idea what the preceding organisms were from the late Precambrian, like Dickinsonia and Kimberella, things like that. Mm -hmm. But with more data, we actually see that there's a continuity in these organisms. We have like lineages such as mollusks, which are so good, they actually cross the Cambrian, uh, the, the Ediacaran Cambrian divide. And so we can see from something like uh, Kimberella which is sort of a pre-mollusk. And then once you cross the Cambrian, you get like um, Woaxia and Orthrosanculus, these things which are like the basal most mollusks. And then you get mollusk diversity. The same is true of arthropods. You get pre, or like sort of proto-arthropods like uh, Yalingia in the Ediacaran. Then you get the very earliest arthropods in the, uh, early, in the early Cambrian. And then you get a, a burst of diversity sort of around the middle Cambrian. And this leads to ultimately your, your modern groups of arthropods. But 
but in all these cases, you have a sort of you have a continuity. You have things that cross the boundary, so like cloudinids and uh, anaborides, things like that. Which also, show also you have to bear in mind that like the uh, like the fauna that we get from like uh, uh, the, the butch shell, these are uh, lager staten. Like, like they are they are, they are very yes. rare, very it's rare and very exquisite. Uh, Preservation conditions, which, which right. do not occur all over the place. So when you have like a, a deposition like that, and before it you don't you have you don't have any lacus and then then they all appear to, to have, you have these organisms up as if they appear from nowhere. So right, the exactly. Preservation, I, preservation <clears throat> issues is is an uh, relevant factor here. So I'd right, like to but, get uh, Ahmed's take on on what's happened so far because right. I think we've gotten okay. we've gotten the points in that these fossils are rare. <clears throat> but there is continuity between the Precambrian and the Cambrian, and the Cambrian yes. explosion, rather than being a single event, was a process over at least twenty-five million years. So, Ahmed, what do you what do you think yeah. about that? Well, I, I, I think like three things. Number one, whether it's like twelve or twenty-five, looking at the grand picture is 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 still small. So you're looking at 3.8 billion years or something of, of history of life. And then this, this very small fraction but where all of those organisms pop into existence, complicated ones and very diverse ones, um, definitely not, not like any of those that came in, in, in the previous epochs. And then they, they don't only do that, but they continue to, to, to morph into more and more different um, life forms. And then y you, have, you have to appreciate the mathematics of it. So if, if you look into population genetics, you will find that they're doing this calculation called divergence time. And when you look at how much um, difference in DNA do you need between two creatures of, of significant differences in morphology? For example, if you look between the human being and the chimp, you will, you will find like 1.3 million uh, base pair difference or something. And, and those are, are, are things that really make a difference. So how much, how much change is there between uh, uh, a fluffy, slimy thing that was you know, uh, on the seabed or something in, in, in the Diatran, and now it is a, a, a full-fledged uh, fish or a, a really sophisticated creature is, is millions upon millions of, of mutations, if we take the claim of the theory that random mutations is responsible for this. And it's not just mutations, it's mutually constructive mutations. So this mutation is taking it to this direction, and the next one is taking it to the same direction. So you find things like gills, and then soon enough you find things that are between gills and lungs, and then you find things uh, with amphibians that are really more like lungs, and then you find lungs a few, few million well, years later. So that's, 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 that's off of the Cambrian. The long, yeah, that's after after the Cambrian. Well, so the continuation, the continuation of this, Let's keep it to the right, Cambrian so, to make yeah. it as simple as possible, I, I would so say. Even so if you look in the Cambrian, and I, I once had this discussion with, with an evolutionary biologist, and I told him, pick any precursor in the Cambrian and one animal form that is known to have existed within the boundaries of the Cambrian, and let's calculate how much time, if this is really a random process, how much time should this take? And I did a calculation, and he did a calculation. I did a calculation. He didn't come up with, with a specific species. But I, then I said, OK, let's do, do it abstractly. Let's, let's just consider that this is a, 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 a creature that is undergoing mutually constructive mutations in a row. And according to my calculation, which we cannot do in this casual discussion, after the fifth or the sixth mutually constructive mutation, you are out of time. You are beyond the, the, the 4.5 billion years of Earth life. So the point here is whether it's 12 or 25 or even 30 or even if it's anywhere from a from, from few millions of years is not enough just to make one creature morph uh, uh, in, in, in one of its organs change. 
set aside uh, all oh. this crazy amount of creatures. So this is the mathematics. Uh, like, when you, when you, like when you were referring to the calculation, are you referring to Derwood and Smith or, or B? I'm sorry? Like uh, or you, you mentioned the calculations of how long it takes to for, the, for these mutations. So. Hey, before we get to that, I do want to make sure we get oh. this, this super chat in. So Rodent, no last name, said mm -hmm. for $10, uh, sad that people searching for, quote, truth ignore actual data. And so thank you very much for your super chat, uh, Rodent, no last name. Uh, can I? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Can I, can I respond to this? Um, so so um, for one thing, it's, it's not always, mutations are not always like, it's not always a, a long, gradual series of just like incremental, tiny minor mutations. Sometimes you can't have actually mutations which cause relatively large changes. Things like a heterocracy, where you change yeah. the timing of development of different parts, which actually plays a, a pretty big role in evolution. So rather than having like a hundred mutations, which each make you, or which each slightly change like your facial okay, region, okay, for instance. I got some feedback from Ahmed, I think. Yeah, so, yeah, so, uh, Ahmed, is there any way you could mute while you're not talking? Because we're getting some feedback from you. That I want to be what again? We're, we're hearing like sound from, from your end while you weren't talking. Yeah, is there any way you, ah, could, okay. you could just mute yourself while you're not talking just because we're getting a lot of... I'm not sure if it's feedback yeah, or sure, if there's sure, wind sure, or something. Sure, sure, sure. But, but furthermore, th these calculations are often misleading because you're looking at these mutations and you're saying like every mutation is equally likely when that's just not the case. Or you're you're only looking at it in the sense of 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 um, point mutations. Like it would take a hundred point mutations for this structure to happen, which is generally not the case. Generally, you have something like a duplication, and then you have mutation point mutations in that duplicated gene, which cause large changes, right? Because now yeah. you have two versions of this one gene rather than just one. And so mutations can have a huge range of functions, which is why I pretty in examples where uh, anti-evolutionists or creationists are doing these exper these these number games, I tend to just ignore those because it kind of misses the reality of how mutations work. Yeah. Also, so, I, 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 oh, if you if you are done, uh, I have two, two points to make. Uh, if I remember correctly, there was a paper uh, like a, a year ago, or maybe more, about. Uh, the genetic evolution of animals, like animals as a whole. And it shows that uh, counter yes. to your perception, the evolution of like the phyla, like uh, uh, autopods and vertebrates, etc., that are associated with the Cambrian, these evolve by losses of genes instead of gaining new ones, basically. So it's it's kind of backwards. Like it's, it's almost like they were specializing into certain body plants and then they lost some genes for those, but the, my second point was like you, you uh, said in the beginning about uh, the creatures in the Cambrian were unlike those that came before. But it's, it's a bit vague when you say unlike. So can you specify that by, by what you mean unlike? Like 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 what Jackson mentioned, uh, uh, Kimberella and also uh, uh, the, the, the mollusk. Uh, what's his name again? The, Oh, uh, Galingia, the the panarchopod. Yeah, yes, yeah, also that. And I'm a bit, uh, I mean the, uh, the 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 mollusk, like the uh, precambrian pre oh. mollusk. Oh well, I was uh, that was a Kimberella, and okay. then once you cross into the Cambrian, yeah, you have yeah, like yeah, Wil yes. Wilwaxia and Orthrosanclus. Right, right. So like, like Jackson mentioned, creatures that are, that are like those that are in the Cambrian that, that came before before, but yeah, but, because but, they but share you, the same part. You, yeah, yeah. The, maybe you think they are unlike, but what, what do you mean by that? You're still uh, muted, you're, by you're the muted, way. Sorry. If he's talking. Hello. Yep, you're back. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. So, so you said two things here. So about the the, the matter of losing genes. So uh, this has this has always been you know perplexing to me because. If, if we put forward uh, an argument that evolution is happening by losing information, then we need to justify the reverse gradient because this means that the more we go back in time, at least until a certain point of time, we need to find creatures that have so much wealth of information that losing it, that losing some of those controls unlocks features. So it means those creatures are really loaded with features. So then the question comes back, 
if, if, if we have such a comprehensive design at an earlier stage, until when does this gradient come? And why does the gradient start oh, yeah. from very low information? Can I, can I, very can high. I, can yeah. I make a correction uh, quickly? Like, like you think that uh, having more genes means you have more like, complicated features. Like for example, you have, you have a cre creature with uh, arthropod legs and vertebrate gills and such. No, it doesn't mean that like, uh, gene, like genes, you can, you, you can have a huge number of genes, but depending on how you use them, you can you can still have a very simple body plan. Like right. I think like there are a few there, like, there, like, yeah, yeah, there, there, are, there are a few single celled organisms who have way more genes than we do. Yeah. It's just a yeah, matter like of how, a, it's just a matter of how to use them. Uh, amoebas, isn't it? They have or like some of them yeah. have like four times the number of genes that we have. But they're amoebas. Like you would think you would think that they're quote, you know, simpler. But they have way more genes than we do. Same with like onions; they have way more genes than we do. Same with grass. So it's, it's, so it's not it's not like uh, when you go back, you have like uh, the more genes you have, the more complicated things become. They can still be yeah. simple, but it's, it's just it's just the number of genes that they have. They use it in a different way, and it doesn't necessarily translate into a more complicated body plan. Right. Yeah, the, the, the very aspect of, you know, losing genes that makes a creature unfold into a phenotypically more sophisticated creature is perplexing from the information aspect. More information means you have more potential for sophistication. Yeah, but, but, it, but, but, it does, say, but more, more potential doesn't necessarily mean you have more sophistication. Like we already pointed out at uh, Amoeba, have way more genes than we do, but they are still very simple compared to us in the body plan aspect. So it's a like I, th I think you are like uh, coming from a perspective of uh, like a very very intuitive perspective of more genes means more complicated things. But in biology, it's not that simple. Right. I I ironically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if 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 you if you put it that those extra genes were not used for anything. Then the question no, then no, would they, be, no, they, 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 they may be used for different things, but not for making more complicated body plans. They may be used for different things. Yeah, yeah. So they are relevant to the complexity of the body plan or to the sophistication of the final phenotype. So the question then will be, if this is the case, then why would losing them cause the creature to unfold into an apparently more complex creature? This is so this is, I can actually answer this question. question. So when you look at the phylogenomics of like the animal kingdom, for instance, of, of metazoa, and you see that they're losing certain types of genes, but other gene families expand through duplication events. So for instance, you have sets, you have gene families which are duplicated immensely. Things like uh, being related to cancer prevention, for instance, because the more cells you have, the more likely you're, you're probably gonna have cancer. So the so genes in those families expand they have they duplicate over and over and over and over like like uh, p52 is is one of them but other genes that we don't need anymore we can lose without any deleterious effect because we we're in an environment now where we don't need them right that's what that's what um uh dapper was talking about in in your original debate with um with e coli right it didn't need the genes for or it didn't need to metabolize citrate in, in an aerobic in, in an aerobic environment, but it had mutations which gave it the ability to metabolize citrate in an aerobic environment, right? And it's the same thing sort of going on here. You change or you increase your gene families related to certain functions, which then allows you to have new functions. Like, uh, you know, um, arthropods probably didn't need to evolve like a totally new bunch of sets of genes to evolve limbs, they just needed to uh, change the way their existing genes were were uh, being used, by and large. Does that make sense? Well, the, the, the question then is, if, if you have a gene that you're not using, being set aside, you know, that much, then even according to the assertions of the theory, this gene will not... Um, is not something that is being selected again. It is something dormant. Nobody knows what it's doing, even the, the creature itself. If it's doing something, then losing it loses something. If it's not doing anything, then it's maybe 
uh, neutral mutation. Nobody cares. Yes, so the that's question correct. Then is if it's if 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 this is the case, it still means that those genes were irrelevant to the context. So losing them or keeping them shouldn't really have any specific effect, especially if this effect is more complex. Well, now, if you are you looking at a gene that was a regulatory gene, for example, that was prohibiting a creature from, uh, you know, uh, be, being better or be, being bigger because there isn't that much food, and then you lose it so you can get bigger without the control, then yes, that might have. But can this kind of thing really be the, 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 the reason, the driver of, of real complexity arising from the um, of information, I find this quite a far thing. No, 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 no. I, I think you're misunderstanding. Losing genes because of other of mutations that you're... Yeah, I think that's actually it. Um, so when you lose a mutation, or when, sorry, when you lose a gene through neutral mutations, so this gene, it doesn't matter what happens to it now. So even if you have a mutation which knocks it out, it doesn't matter to you as an organism because you're not using it for anything. But losing that gene does not mean you're getting more complex. You are gaining genes in other regions through duplication events. And then those duplicated genes are being accepted for new functions. So like um, in the case of, you know, a fins to limbs, you don't have to have a whole bunch of new genes to evolve limbs from fins. You just need to change the way fins are expressed. Change that. Change the way the fin rays are expressed. Once you change, once you have minor incremental changes to those, then you get these new features. Or they, they're not really new; they're just building on the existing features, right? And so that's where the complexity is coming from. It's coming from adding on to the existing features through duplication and heterochrony and these other sorts of mutations. But it's not the losing itself that is making you more complex. Does that make sense? Yes, this makes sense, which, 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 which goes back to my original question. So for you to get into, um, you know, having a limb by modifying what a fin is, because the fin has inside the rails for the fingers, etc., mm -hmm. you start from having the fin, okay? Yes. But then you, there is no um, fathomable way where you can think you can get a fin without a fin altogether in a precursor. So this is now... I'm sorry, I'm sorry, say that one more time, please. If, if, if you are looking at potential modification for a fin so okay. that it becomes a limb, uh -huh. okay, we might think of things. But then how did you get the fin? So we actually you couldn't can... have got the fin from deletion of information because then... Well, actually, we you can, know. and we do. Uh, this is kind of like the example that Dapper was talking about in, in your debate where you're on a train and you're saying trains can't exist. We actually have already done lots and lots and lots of experiments, not we, us here, but the, the researchers have done lots of experiments where they modified either zebrafish fins or the fins of, of bichers. And by simple mutations, or actually by having uh, bichers, for instance, living in a partial terrestrial environment, their fins turn uh, become like the fins of lobe fin fish, which are our ancestors. But they're not lobe fin fish, they're ray fin fish. And hey, so you can quick, express certain... Real quick, oh, I want to yeah, make sure okay. we get a $5 super chat in from Roden, no last name again, who says, creationists fail at understanding populations. It's not one critter gaining one mutation, it's one billion critters with a 0.01% chance of, uh, I think he says mutation, but he wrote muration. Yeah. And if it's muration, then you need to tell me what that is. It sounds like something involved with rats. But it might anyway, be. Um, Sorry. But going. yeah, so we've already, uh, we, they, they have already, the researchers have already done experiments where you can raise bichers, which are fish, ray finned fish in a partially terrestrial environment, and they develop lobe finned, and they develop lobe fins. Or you can tweak the genes of zebrafish, and they develop lobe fins. They, th this, we, they can show by simple modifications, either in the environment or in the genes, that going from fins, which would not be able to support you at all, to fins, which, again, can't quite support you yet, but they're on the way there, are possible by simple mutations. And actually, here you go. Yeah, there's, there's an example of it. So this has already been done. This is really not 
a point of discussion or a point of controversy for, for evolutionists. Do you see what uh, I mean? I, 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 think, I think the whole point here is you, you, it is like somebody, you know, who knows what has happened already. And then you say, okay, uh, if, if this is the case, the prediction is so and so, trying to prove his hypothesis after the fact. The whole trick is if you want to prove an hypothesis, you couldn't, you, you should not know the result or, or already. So it is very different when you look at a researcher who, who sees this kind of thing and who knows what are the differences between that gene and this gene. And then you calculate these things as if they are independent events and you calculate probabilities. I'm because how it happened really originally is not this way because the mutation does it not had know to. where you want to go. But it had to though, because we can look at the gene. We can literally look at the genes that are different between our fins, our fins, between our limbs and the fins of lungfish and the limbs of coelacanths and the limbs of zebrafish. We can literally look at these and see which mutations in which genes were involved in making limbs from fins. Hey guys, real quick, so, uh, this administrative bit, uh, but Nestle, your presentation isn't coming through anymore, so if you could just stop the presentation. I see it. I'm, I'm, I'm not, it. he might have to restart it, because if I'm not, no oh. one else is on, on this. Yeah, because I'm seeing he's showing the picture with the, the uh, actinopterygians and Oh, I, uh, I'm sure he is. I'm just saying, I can't, so he might need to restart it because oh. I'm the one who's okay, screen sharing, so mm -hmm. if I can't see it, the audience can. Oh, uh, okay, gotcha. Well, the, the point is, we we know which mutations in which genes occurred, like we know which did in the past, and so by tweaking, and the point of tweaking um, existing fins, like zebrafish or whatever, is just a way of showing how this can happen. Like this is the gene that's involved in that process. I'm, this is I'm still not this seeing is, this. Like I'm sorry. I, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I don't, I don't oh, know it's, why. It's, it's probably on my it. end. Look, because Jackson sees it, and Jackson's intro yeah. is absolute terribleness. I assume <laughs> I was assuming it's my problem, and Jackson, you know, I'm right about that. It, you are correct. I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm out seeing it. I can't see it, so there. I, I don't know no, why. No, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm out. Can he? Can he see it all? Yeah, oh, he know. he might be able to. I guess we could keep it if if we think it is really important for Ahmed to see it. Well, at, at any rate, so the the point I'm just trying to make is, we we can already see by doing the phylogeny which changes occurred and by doing these experiments where we induce these changes in living organisms this is just showing we know this is what happened and this is how this happens and we can show developmentally how this happens right it's, it's the thing about the train riding the train while saying trains don't exist all right so so here, here's my take which can be the seed for this debate if we are going to do this um that we are seeing it now because we, we see that this gene has this morphology and that other gene has that other morphology and we can see the differences. And we see how many differences and where they happen and we... Yes. When, when you're starting from a backdrop that it, it, it happened by mutations, uh, then your conclusion will be that it happened by mutations. And then the answer will be, well, there is no other way that it would have happened. Well, but there are other ways. Yeah, but, but if you start from the point that you have the precursor and you need now to consider what are the mutation rates and what are the error correction rates in that specific creature, and then you do specific probability calculations given the population size of that creature and, uh, and uh, the duration of time it takes per generation, and then you, you end up uh, uh, assuming that one mutation has taken place in the right place, and this is the first one. And then you start making a conditional probability calculation for uh, what is the odds for the second one to happen in the right place, given the population size and given the mutation rates and given the error correction rates. And you also consider how much extra fitness it gives and how much time it takes to be fixated in enough members of the population so that the mutations that are happening in the population in the second iteration find enough members in that population so that the random mutations will end up doing enough trials and error correction will not kill it and offsprings will not go away yes. and they will not be stepped over and you do this calculation yeah. in this way the in chronological order it is very challenging and no it, it's not really, it's not yeah, challenging I would, really, 
I, I would really like to have this done maybe in, in, in online. We open an Excel sheet. We have the real mutation dates. We have real genome size. We have so, the number of mutations difference between two morphologies. And we do so, the calculation. Ahmed. Let's see where it takes us. Yeah. So Ahmed, if, for instance, when I point to, say, the peppered moth example, which is a, an example of, in modern times, an organism which underwent a mutation in a, I think it was a promoter region, if I remember correctly, but it underwent this mutation, which caused a novel morphology that did not previously exist. We know the, ex literally the, or I, I think, to like uh, uh, two or three years, like when this mutation occurred. <clears throat> yeah, and we have the, historical records of the first sightings yeah. of melanistic moths, which means, and we yes. have reportings of sightings from naturalists before that, so we know at least yes, within it a few did years. Not exist. Sorry. <laughs> it did not exist in this population. We know the mutation that caused it, and we know, and so after that mutation happened, because we know the exact mutation, this, it, the, the, pop, the population, or this mutation went almost to fixation in the population because of the selective pressure, which is birds eating it, right? Because the birds can see the white mm. moths against the, yeah. the trees or whatever, because everything's covered with soot, um, where they, whereas they cannot see the black ones. This happened in less than 100 years. Less than 100 years. So this, this and I, I know, they have, moths have a very short population time, right, fine. Okay, granted. But the fact that this happened, and it's not just in, in moths, we can come up with other examples um, where you have this uh, sort of fixation in natural environments. But it really doesn't take very long. Even with sexually reproducing organisms, it does not take very long. So in, in my experience, when I try to do these calculations myself, the first point, mutation, is not the issue. Typically, you can resolve that given specific parameters of a specific creature. You can resolve that you will do the first point mutation in a reasonable time. The problem is when you go on calculating further mutually constructive mutations with that one, that will continue in the same direction so that the fin, for example, will change from this to that to that other one, which are all going from a fin that is not supporting you very well to a, a, a fin that is supporting you very well. And you take these conditional probabilities in cascade, the amount of time that you need to go from this one mutation to the next mutually constructive one increases almost exponentially with more mutations that you add. This is, this is maybe so, I'm doing the calculation in, in, in a wrong way, but... <laughs> so I, I, think, I, yeah. I think you are doing the calculations wrong because what we're seeing is mm. you, you see that these, these, these in natural populations, in sexually reproducing natural populations, we have these mutations which can go to essentially fixation in a relatively short amount of time. This is just in arthropods, right? This is not even, this is excluding like bacteria and, and protists and things like that. Okay, but if, if your calculations are coming up with way ridiculously longer times than are like observationally needed to reach the to reach fixation, then your calculation is wrong. It's not that the data itself is wrong, it's that your calculation is wrong. You see what I'm saying? It's not it's not the fixation that takes more time. The fixation will always take the same time when the mutation has occurred. Because, no, that no, is not the on, case. Real, real quick. Yeah. I want to say Welcome to yeah. Dr. Daniel Stern. Car I, I, I always get it wrong. I think it's oh, no. the E is Cardinal. Is the E isn't pronounced? Isn't pronounced? Welcome, it's, Dan. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just Cardinal. Am I here? Can yes. You hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. But, okay, cool. Yeah, I don't have my camera Dan, on. Dan, uh, are you there? Uh, <laughs> but Sorry, no, it's it's it is definitely not the case that mutations always take the same well, amount of time hey, hey to guys. reach fixation in a population. We have a new That's panel member, so I want to make sure that we get his first impressions of the debate in before we continue on because like I said, that's yeah. how I run my after shows. Everyone who's on the panel gets their first um mm. impressions and then we can continue on. So Dan, what were your initial impressions of the debate? And I know I there were a few things that I said that were primarily for your ears so <laughs> <laughs> yes there were a few things that were were uh they sounded very familiar uh <laughs> so i i greatly appreciated that um actually let me just say that i only have a few minutes so at some point i'm just gonna have to be like sorry i'm done gotta go so um at some point i'm just gonna vanish with with no reason um just so everyone knows but um so my thoughts on the debate were that it was a really enjoyable conversation to listen to um but I felt like I felt like the the what we kind of the the I mean I felt like the the 
talking points were very kind of just out of the standard creationist playbook. And it was all stuff that you've all heard before. And it was, it was, you know, it was, it was totally good and fine, but it was, there was nothing original, no original synthesis of, of new ideas to, to attempt to refute the, the kind of idea of evolution. It was just the same kind of stuff. And there was irreducible complexity and genetic entropy. And like, uh, now we're talking about just now the waiting time problem. Like these are all things that are, well trodden and there are evolutionary explanations or rebuttals for all of these things and that's kind of where i came down that it was i think better and more informative than most debates of this nature were but it relied upon the same set of exchanges that we often see in these conversations uh, do you have any do you have to comment on that yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, it was directed at you, so you were definitely get the right. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, so um, I, I think that in, in the majority of conversations, you will, you will have more or less um, maybe not identical arguments, but similar ones. But um, I, I think that one, one of the important things here is that um, evolutionary discussions or discussions about evolution and creation are typically stuck in the point of, um, is it evolution or is it not evolution? But maybe um, an elaboration of that discussion can be, if it's not evolution, then what? And I think uh, a major blocking uh, uh, um, issue here is that creationists will typically go that it's not evolution and it is creatures Poofing into existence. I actually have uh, a different explanation that maybe other creationists do not agree upon. But there is a different explanation. And that a different explanation uh, is, is originating from similar arguments. But it doesn't need to be that organisms are poofing into existence. Theologically, this is acceptable. But um, there are things, I think there are two premises here. Number one, um, if, if, if you look at the holistic point of view to the theory, there is the very big question mark of, of what is the real direction of the gradient of information and why there is love, life altogether, which will, bring us, which will bring us back to abiogenesis, which is not part of the biological evolution, but is a very related context. And then the very first question is how much information was in the first proto cells or in Luca? And then is it is it a fair argument to say that all of this extra information that are resulting in all of those morphologies are coming from random mutations and natural selection? And I think that at a point there needs to be a conversation. Ness, like all your mouse clicks are coming through. Can you mute? With evolutionists and creationists on both sides listening to each other. Because I think it boils down to this. If, if, if you consider a genetic algorithm model or, or, or a trial and error model, can such a model without an objective, objective function produce this kind of uh, uh, flurry of information and, 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 and the kind of diversity of life that we see? I think this is the essential part where discussions will become very different. Because you will always start from the, the the same arguments, but where the arguments end up is, is the topic. And I think the topic is so big that you have to have uh, a little bit more focus. Hey, real, real quick, one uh, Ahmed, hold on one second. Yeah. Oh, no, I just wanted to make sure because Netflix's uh, mouse clicks were coming through, and uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize I was. Yeah, no, it's okay. I just wanted to make sure that you knew. Um, and uh, yeah, and Ahmed, uh, back to you. I just sorry, it was. It was happening a lot, so I wanted to try and cut that out. So, okay. Uh, so I, I think that, for example, this kind of discussion that we're having now, doing a real CPS calculation, we say that irreducible complexity, for example, and then somebody brings up the flagellum, but the flagellum is so many proteins, and then somebody will say, okay, you can reduce it to a five basic meter or whatever. Um, but then if you are looking at something like the kinesin or like diary, it is already a, a, a very small thing. And protein motors are, for example, something 
something that we should look at when we are looking at a reducible complexity. I'm not sure how many real discussions have happened around something that is very basic like this, uh, something like the um, uh, uh, ATP uh, cycle. Uh, so these kind of things, it is the same general argument, but what are you specifically discussing? How much is it critical for life? How do things like microtubules pop into existence? How do things like kinesins pop into existence? How much are they ubiquitous from the process of cell division to moving things around to moving uh, even uh, material uh, over uh, uh, neutron uh, uh, fibers, uh, sorry, um, uh, neuron fibers, etc. So I think there isn't much enough debate and, you know, peaceful and respectful conversation happening between people who are on the intelligent design or creation oh, side. I warned that I would have to run on short notice, and uh, yeah. there there it is. So, um, sorry I couldn't stay longer, everybody, but i got to run. Talk to you all later. Okay. And um, I would like, I'd like to get some responses in from that. Um, so, <clears throat> and I guess I'm sort of de by de facto just sort of becoming uh, a bit of a moderator, and that's okay by me. So, uh, Jackson or Nestle, would either of you like to uh, address that? And Ahmed, if you could um, maybe mute while you're while they're responding, just sure. because we're getting uh, some like ambient noise, sorry and getting... for the noise. Sorry for the noise because I uh, I was interested to join you guys and I had to do this uh, short trip, so I'm moving. Yeah, in the it's car, all right. So no, no worries. It's funny. okay. Yeah, the only no, yeah, no, okay. the only request is that while you're not talking, yeah, just just mute so that way it, it doesn't um, come through while you're not talking. But yeah, no, it's fine. Um. So my my response is, um. Yeah, you're you're kind of right. Um. About why are there no debates on things like the evolution of the citric acid cycle or kinesins? Uh, well, <laughs> the sad reason is uh, it won't attract very many people because once you kind of get to the point where you're arguing like between two people who are extremely knowledgeable in like cell biology, um, you're getting into the biochemistry and that kind of stuff, you're going to lose like the vast majority of your audience. That's why we tend, uh, well, for me at the very least, I tend to stick with with organisms that you know we have a fairly good grasp on because everyone's like oh i know what a fruit fly is i know what the peppered moth is what e coli is but you know, when you start getting into things you're talking about like oh well this is where phosphatidylcholine comes in and all that kind of stuff the audience is lost and and it's kind of sad that that happens but you know eh, this is youtube so yeah uh, by the way um we are at about a, an hour so one thing i will say now is um if people <clears throat> have questions about the topics we're bringing up now or the topics that were brought up during the debate, uh, please ask them. And if you don't super chat, please do at least remember to um, at Dapper Dino. So that way I make sure that there's a better chance that I see it. And um, because every once in a while chat does go quickly, um, the most secure way is obviously to super chat, but it's far from necessary. So, um, but if I do miss something, uh, remind me. So like, if you guys do have questions about that, uh, we will be taking questions, and that could be for any of the panel members, including myself. So uh, feel free uh, for any topics about what we're discussing here or during the debate. And um, so continue on, everybody. Sorry. But yeah, no, you're, you're kind of right, Ahmed, that, that um, you know, these discussions tend to fall into the same exact uh, lines of argumentation, like ENCODE or genetic entropy. And we've all heard, you know, these things numerous times. Heck, several of us have made videos, you know, on our channels regarding those topics. So, but yeah, the, the more, um, like, super complex and uh, very obscure topics, while, while they may be very interesting, um, are just not the ones that, like, most your average person is going to understand or be interested in. Like, how many people are going to be interested in uh, whether one genus of barnacle is replacing another genus of barnacle? over millions of years. Darwin. That is actually a de well okay fine Darwin. But th th that is actually a debate that occurred in some paleontological circles. But like how many people actually care? Not very many. Right? It, it's just the nature of the debate and the nature of YouTube. So what do you what do you think about that? I'm I'm surprised that actually some of those videos that science explainers would go into uh, explaining things uh, have 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 really hundreds of thousands of views sometimes. So uh, uh, for example, I have a background in, uh, due to my background as a communications engineer.
here and, and, and things like quantum mechanics and uh, you know uh, electromagnetics, etc. Some channels like uh, TBS, uh, for example. Yeah. Uh, you would find uh, a discussion about uh, a very detailed thing uh, about uh, general relativity or quantum mechanics with, with hundreds of thousands of views. And I'm sure, <laughs> yeah. really, there isn't hundreds of thousands of people around the world who know what the guy is talking about. But sometimes, even when the discussion is yeah. Going, uh, yeah. Uh, peculiar, people just like to listen. Actually, I think the matter of biological evolution has um, uh, a very strong connection to our world view and our theological positions and our uh, you know existential questions. That even if you are going into a discussion where you will have to go into uh, tricky stuff, you can uh, number one you can simplify it. Uh, like for example, when I thought I am going to talk about the Hadith as an example, I thought that the best thing is to show a video because no matter how much time I'm talking about this molecule that is walking on, on, on a special bridge that gets built when it wants it, nobody would imagine it. But <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, but actually, I, I'm serious. The first time I saw this, it brought three tears to my eyes that these things are, are really happening and they are so beautiful and this way. I couldn't believe as an engineer that such ingenuity can come about through a random mutation process that would generate such a magnificent integrated system. Well, and I think that these details are the ones that need to be addressed to the public by evolutionists. And these details are the ones that need that we sit and do the math and see how come this thing can happen when what are the precursors and I think that the absence of answers to these questions is the real issue that well, really only put in the books and they don't come into debates. Well actually in fairness um, I, uh, I, well Nestle and I did a video on the evolution of a, of a protein, of an enzyme called ATP synthase. So there are papers, there are lots and lots and lots of scientific papers on the evolution of ATP synthase. As there are oh, the evolution. To be of the fair, I, I think you made that video before I came around with the, the editing. Of, I, I think so. But, uh, uh, oh well, I don't, well. At any rate, we, we did a video a long time ago on HP synthase. Now the fact that people on YouTube like Dapper and TD and myself and Ness, like the fact that we you know won't usually broach like tiny the evolution of tiny molecular parts in debates doesn't mean no one's doing research on them. There's absolutely research on it. There are papers that show the step-by-step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step evolution of ATP synthase from formerly existing ATP aces, right? There's loads of data on that. And there's loads of data on, on like the evolution of, of kinesin and all sorts of other proteins. We, uh, we actually, Nestle and I, uh, we, we happen to know a guy who does like, um, the evolution of like abiotic or, or proteins or, or amino acids, sorry, in under abiotic conditions, right? So yeah, there's and, loads yeah, of research. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey and guys, so I want there's to read loads the, uh, of research on this. When you're done, Jackson. I'm sorry. There's a super chat for when you're done. Oh, oh no! Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So for two dollars from Roden, no last name. He asks, "Does life in quotes require quote God magic?" And uh, my answer is. Um, it's not actually clear what it takes to produce life. And so I don't have any particular reason to think it has to, but I guess I can't say for certain. And uh, I guess we can go around the panel and get, um, please keep them relatively short, but we'll try to get answers to that. So Jackson, we'll start with you. We'll go then to Ahmed, uh, Deslig, and then TD Lane, because that's the order that I'm seeing you guys in. So Jackson? You want my, my answer? Does life need God magic? Yeah, it's got I, a I question mark. So. We gotta we gotta answer the question, right? He paid I, I, two dollars. I don't think it requires God magic. Okay, that's my uh, position. Ahmed. Well, I think it requires something that is not materialistic, and um, if you invoke something that's not materialistic, that's definitely supernatural, and um, I wouldn't call it magic. I would just call it something that is outside. Uh, our reach and um, the reason I think so is that um, with all the knowledge that we have make even a protocell living according to our definition of life the only way that we can make it living is to change the definition of life okay somebody might say this will change for years but I, but I don't think so 
All right. And uh, Nestle? Oh, uh, oh I, I, I don't know. It's a difficult question to ask because it's, it's outside of science, of course. Like science could never say magic is not required. It can only identify like oh, what is a plausible mechanism that we can test and make predictions about. So uh, in that regard, it uh, even even if it is uh, required, we would never know it by science. But in my own opinion, I don't think so. It's my opinion. Okay. And uh, T. Lane. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit busy because uh, Otangelo and Chat cited a uh, paper by John Sanford and uh, Basiner that uh, has a quote he used. All right. So uh, no comment. Yeah. Okay. It, fair enough. It's taken secondarily out of co context, from what I can tell. So it's okay. like. All right. Well, there we I go. I should take Sanford's word. <laughs> so, um, again, if you guys, if you guys do have questions, you can super chat or tag at Deborah Dino, and uh, we will ask them as long as they seem reasonably on topic. If it's like, you know, how's the weather? Probably not. I'll read the super chat, but I'm not going to sit there and answer it for you. Um, so, you know. Can I make an extra um, comment on this matter of life with magic? Oh, yeah, I guess so. All right. So, um, uh, I, I think that there are specific, at least in my religion in Islam, which is an extrapolation or a continuation to other Abrahamic religions anyway. There are some specific assertions that are made. Um, one of them is the impossibility of uh, human science to create life. Actually, we have a specific verse that if we translate it to English, it would be saying that um, it, it will be um, uh, a call out to the people who do not believe in God that no matter how many people um, group and team up together to create a fly, they will never be able to do so. And I'm not really sure why was a fly specifically picked up, but it is pretty intriguing to me that so much research is done over fruit fly. So the assertion is, no matter what you do, you cannot make a fly. And I think this is there for a reason. And the reason is that what it takes to make life is either completely supernatural or is a prediction that God is putting on the table that human science will never reach the point to create life. And I so, think that this is a very simple argument for naturalism. If you want to completely break a religion like Islam, just make one fly. So it's can standing, I respond? It's a standing challenge. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd right. like to hear Jackson respond. So I, I think that you already know my answer. Nobody has ever even tried to make a fly because there's no point. There's like essentially no scientific value in trying to just make a fly, right? Um, there, the experiments which I, I think you're referencing, where you know they are dealing with abiotic or the prebiotic conditions that life would have evolved in, or the parts that make up life would have would have evolved in. They're not trying to make a cell. They're not trying to make an organism. They're just trying to make parts which under conditions could contribute to an organism but i'm not really going into abiogenesis but regardless the other thing that i kind of wanted to to respond to that i mean that was my my major point was that no one's trying to make a fly and what would be the point of that it, it doesn't really matter no one cares enough there no one's saying like we want to destroy religion so we're going to make a fly or something like that no one's doing that it doesn't matter the other thing was what makes life it has nothing to do as far as I've ever seen, as far as I've ever read, with supernatural things. Like, if you look at a prion, for instance, or a viroid, these are things which are not organisms. Dan may get mad at me for saying that. They're not <laughs> organisms, as far as most biologists would consider them. Wait, are we gonna have to have a viruses are or aren't organisms debate? Look, it, honestly, in, in my opinion, they, you know, they do reproduction, uh, yeah. fine, or whatever. Uh, okay, they do reproduction, and under certain circumstances, they can, yeah. like, make, well, they, in, my, in my opinion, life life is a process, and when a virus in, when a sure. virus infects a cell, then it's alive, then then, sure. it, then it okay. does living. All right, well, right. Let, keep, keep going but, there. But the point is, it's it's a set of, of yeah. you're right. It's a, it's a process. It's a set of conditions which, together, once met under certain conditions, 
produce what we call life. A prion on its own is not living, but when a bunch of prions infect like a cow and cause a, like, was a Jacob Kreutzfeldt syndrome, then it's kind of acting like a living organism. But Jackson, is it a living organism? Jackson, it, it, I think I yes. hear angry geneticist sounds <laughs> over yonder. So I, that, that's I mean, a valid question. I don't take though. a hard position on this, on the our viruses living debate. I don't, it doesn't really matter to me because um, I'm also in the position that species is kind of a, is a difficult term and purposefully like um, hinders conversations. So maybe that's why, I don't know. I'm sorry, Dapper. Oh no, so what, um, I would like to hear a response to that question though. Um, like since life is a bit of a gradient and we have things that are sort of on the cusp of being alive and things that are less so, and then we have things that no one disagrees are alive. Um, what is that? How does that inform your, your statement about uh, life and its sort of special nature? Um, yeah. At any rate. Huh. Whoops. Also, like, uh, oh. uh, like, like you, you brought up like uh, the kinesin proteins. Uh, it, uh, I remember like a uh, review article about the evolution of uh, uh, motor proteins, and I can uh, link you the article in the chat if you are interested. It's an, it's an open access article, I think. Yes, it, it, it's open access. I also put uh, uh, the title in the chat because the link will get blocked. I think. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, okay. Um, you meant me with a question about the gradient of life, right? Yes. So um, oh. at least as I understood it, there the, the question, and maybe I'm wrong, Jackson. Feel free to fix me on this. Um, so there is a gradient of going from things that everyone agrees aren't alive to things where there is some debate to things where most people would say, yeah, this is probably alive, all the way to things where there's, again, no debate the other way. Right. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. So um, my, my take on this is, um, is an analogy with, 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 with what we do as humans. But let's, let's first go back to the fly. So... When scripture, for example, talks about a fly or a mosquito, so we have a fly and a mosquito in the Quran, actually. And um, those are, you know, the, some of the smallest things that are perceived, you know, small insects that are perceived by people who receive that scripture. So you cannot have in scripture something like create a bacteria because bacteria is not known. But I think that the message here is create the smallest thing that you will have consensus is living and you will not be able to. And if, if you go back to the debate that I was having with Dapper there, um, so, so in my opinion, life is, is, is a matter of an identity. So the question is, does a virus have an identity? Does a virus really care about life? So to me, by analogy, we look at, you know, programs that do certain things that we program in my world. And, and then we have viruses that are essentially messages. They are small pieces of code that are essentially messages uh, that hijack something so that you get access to a system or that you uh, 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 deny service somewhere, it's, which is essentially very similar to what uh, the kind of diseases that viruses cause. So I think that a virus is, is, does not have the necessary analogy to life. A virus is like a programmatical message from a life form to another life form. Now, it raises the question of where do viruses come from? Because a virus... Um, doesn't make sense that viruses were there before living cells. Because what, what a virus is, is a system well, that hijacks a living cell. Unless you believe in well, well, it, it, it may It may be possible. Like, uh, I, of course, it's still uh, uh, an area of research. But I have seen it. There may, there may have been viruses at the interface of between when life emerged. And all, all a virus really needs is a ribosome 
in order to copy itself. And ribosomes could theoretically exist outside the cell if right, it's okay. able to, uh, if you have a right, if you have a right environment. So yeah. Yeah, That's or funny. vice versa. We have organisms like bacteria who don't on their own meet all the conditions of a quote living organism. Like the rickettsia uh, bacteria or oh. chlamydia, these cannot live on their own outside of cells. They require other cells to live inside. But they're living, aren't yeah, they? We, we, uh, we, we, have an, we have an incomplete biochemistry. Like we, we, we can yeah. synthesize vitamin C. We can also not synthesize various amino acids. We need to uh, parasitize basically other organisms for that. Or at least uh, well, consume well, them. Yeah. Yeah, this is a general question about parasites altogether, regardless if they are unicellular or not. But the, the, the issue here is, is a little bit different issue, is that uh, for the virus to reproduce, it needs to hijack some living cell to, to, to complete its cycle. Well, again, uh, the basic thing, of course, uh, well, some viruses need uh, to reverse transcribe the RNA into DNA. There are, there are viruses, there are RNA viruses who only need a ribosome to copy itself, and that's it. That's it. Yeah. So yeah. the question is, where will it get the ribosome from? Yeah. So yeah. Of course, in today's in today's world, the ribosome will be found in cells. But there's of course some ideas about perhaps the ribosome occurred before there were cells, like there were individual cells. Well, it, 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 I think it would eventually boil down to whether you, you, you believe in RNA world hypothesis. And I, I think this RNA world hypothesis is not in very good shape these days. But so well, RNA, well, the, the RNA hypothesis is, is very well supported, although it's not supported in the sense that RNA was the first, the first living thing. I don't, there, there, are all, there are also other ideas like metabolism first, where metabolism was the, was the stage before RNA and then the, then DNA became uh, the primary information storage uh, system. But, that, but again, these, these are uh, ideas being discussed. It, it's not uh, it's settled, of course. But yeah, I, I can you can you still hear me? Oh, am I, am I not? Am I breaking up? No. Oh, 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 he left. I mean, maybe Dapper. He, he, he disconnected. Dapper. You're... No, Dapper, they're saying they can't hear you in chat. Uh-oh. Sorry about uh -oh. that. That was probably me I while I was trying... You. Oh, that... Yeah, I know you can. That was me while I was trying to fix weird webcam stuff going on, so sorry about that. I muted myself because I had to do some typing and whatnot. Um, Whoops. Yep. Well, so we lost him. <clears throat> yeah, we lost uh... him. Right? Maybe so, he got um, tired of us. I don't know. Yeah, the <laughs> silent stream. Yeah, it's like the silent spring, except it's a stream. Uh. <laughs> yeah. uh, it could have gone uh, kicked uh, whatever device he could he was using. Yeah, he's still got, well, well, he's still got the join link. He's welcome back. Um, yeah. So I, I do think that a lot of uh, anti-evolutionists try to use um, some kind of ill-defined and uh, never given a mechanism use of supernatural powers to explain the origin of life. Um, yeah. I... It's almost always unfalsifiable, and um, it's it definitely doesn't produce uh, any new avenues of research if you simply right. make that conclusion. That's my main concern. Yes, like like yeah. when you when you for for interest look at like a, a oh, video. Wait, wait, people didn't hear me oh, read the oh. the super chat. The super chat in the first place said, "Is God Magic a good replacement for abiogenesis?" Sorry, this is me being the the worst streamer on YouTube. Hmm. But, but what, I was, what I was saying, like, if you go look at some, like, uh, the Discovery uh, Institute, of, like a YouTube uh, presentation, you can, you can hear them talk for hours upon hours upon hours, like, complaints about uh, how abiogenesis is not solved yet. But then, when, like, if you had a chance of saying, like, oh, all right, let's, for the sake of argument, abiogenesis is wrong. Like, what is your explanation? Just assume abiogenesis is wrong. 
go for it. And then they have nothing to say. <laughs> like it's it's a, it, there is no content behind any of it. it. It's just it's just a negative argument, and that's that's all they have. Yeah. Um. Well. So I'm going to take a few more questions. Uh, obviously, we can't do questions for Ahmed while he's not here. Um, but if Ahmed doesn't come back in about uh, probably 10 to 15 minutes, I think I'll just end it because we've gotten everyone's impression. Um, we've gotten some good discussion in with Ahmed. And, uh, you know, and I, like, I like how we went from camp, camp and Explosion to Abiogenesis <laughs> still. <laughs> always, always. Yeah. Always. always. Um, um, rodent last name. Pepper. Hold on one second. A rodent out last no last name. I think I did, but if, in case it didn't come through again, uh, your most recent super chat was: um, Is God Magic a good replacement for Abiogenesis? And before that, you said: Does life require uh, quote God Magic? Which I think I read all those, but if I didn't, there you go. Uh, Dapper, what was it you were asking earlier? Because I I was preoccupied. I don't remember, dude. The conversation has uh, moved on, and I no longer remember. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Um, but, I mean, it is definitely the case in terms of abiogenesis that it is definitely an open question. And, um, yeah. but the thing is that, uh, science has a really long history of taking open questions, answering the question, and then the answer isn't necessarily, um, that we can't explain it using science. Yeah. I mean, that was, yeah. we, we didn't always yeah. know what, how inheritance works. And now we have a pretty darn good idea. There's really not much of a question on that anymore. So, Inheritance mm -hmm. wasn't some kind of mystical thing before we explained it via DNA. And um, even though there were ideas about that. So, for instance, um, if we go to... Um, actually, we could take the, uh, a, a source from a, a, an Islamic source where uh, someone was asked how, how it is that children end up resembling the mother or the father. And the answer essentially was that... Um, whoever released their genetic material first would be the predominant source of what the child looked like. We know that that's just not, not true at all. And so, but the fact that that was something that people thought at one point, and people thought that it was to some extent controlled by, you know, divine intervention or whatever, doesn't actually mean that that's what was happening. Yeah. So. There, are, there, are, there are lots of interesting ideas about uh, how, how uh, abiogenesis might have taken place, but I, I have my own personal opinions. Like I, I don't, I don't accept the uh, primordial soup hypothesis. Like the, like uh, I, I am, I'm more leaning towards like a hydrothermal vent uh, theory about it. Yeah, there is certainly a lot of options. Yeah. Um, it's not clear at all what. What actually well, it's, it's, this yeah. has happened? It seems it seems uh, thermodynamically speaking, seems more plausible for it to have occurred in like a in a state from far from equ equilibrium, and in, in, in a soup, it's just equilibrium basically. Yeah. Except for except for the occasional lightning strike, and that's it. <laughs> and another, well, yeah. you could even argue that um, if yeah. it's a shallow pool, maybe yeah. um, just the sunlight is enough to provide some gradient. Although then you would have to get into like how likely is it that very early yeah. life could photosynthesize, and it's not and also, super also likely. Like, like uh, one, one research, like uh, if, if, like uh, he has a very good book written, like Nick Lane, the the book on the vital question, and he makes the argument that uh, you like uh, sunlight, even though it has the energy potential to make very complicated molecules, it it also easily destroys them, <laughs> basically, and it, it, yeah. it doesn't really get you anywhere from that point on. Yeah, I can see that argument there. Yeah, and like like I said, I don't necessarily have a a favorite uh, abiogenesis hypothesis. Um, I really don't have a dog in that fight. It's one of those things where it's just like, mm. whatever actually ends up being the um, the actual answer is fine by me. I do care that they, we get an answer. I'm interested to know what it is, but it's I don't have a dog in the fight. And welcome back, Jonathan. Oh, Yay. Welcome back. Oh, oh, oh no. And then he's gone again. I don't know, maybe he has con uh, trouble connecting. It might be like a, a network dead zone or something. That's always the possibility. Yeah, um, possibility. Can we get F's in chat, please? Yeah, F's, F's in the chat for, for Ahmed's uh, his mobile internet. Which is spotty at the best of times. So, you know. Um, uh, as he isn't here, sh shall we uh, all agree that referring to the Old Testament as a plagiarism of the Torah is a bit uh, silly. 
Wait, the Old Testament as a plagiarism of the Whoa. Torah? Yeah, I, I just I just got this in my Twitter timeline. I, that is a it, it's not correct in any way. Yeah, it, the Torah is yeah. part of the Old Testament, and none of the rest of the Old Testament that isn't the Torah is even close to a plagiarism of it. I don't. Yeah, it, the Old Testament what? is just the Christian version of the Tanakh. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, like and really. Um, hey, welcome back. Really? So the only real big yeah. difference between, like, say, the average Protestant Old Testament and the the Hebrew Tanakh is that um, the ordering and the numbering of the books is a little bit different. That's that's literally it. If you look at the Hebrew text that most Protestants translate from, it's the same Hebrew text. So, yeah, I don't know. But uh, sorry about that, Ahmed. Uh, we, we lost you there, but yeah. welcome back. Sorry, the, the, the battery just ran out, so. <laughs> uh, that'll happen. Uh, yeah. So, uh, th th this was a scriptural uh, discussion now, yeah? <laughs> a little bit. There was So, someone had sent TD Lane something silly about the... Uh, the Jewish scriptures. Oh, it wasn't said. It just appeared on my uh, Twitter oh, timeline. Oh, okay. It was it just was like, scrolling through. Yeah, someone had said that the the Torah was a, or sorry, the Old Testament was a plagiarism of the Torah, which none of that makes sense. Yeah. It's it's like it's like saying that uh, the, the the Old Testament is a plagiarism of the Old Testament. Or yeah, exactly. It's the yeah, Torah it is just that's part legitimate of the Old it is. Yeah. 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 Well, so, as yeah. we all know. Uh, the, the entire Quran is just a plagiarism of Surat al-Baqarah. <laughs> yeah, so the whole, the whole is a plagiarism of the part. <laughs> yep, that's to it totally makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, we, we were talking about the viruses thing. So, yeah, if you, if you believe in RNA world hypothesis or something else, but I think, I think the point that is made by religion here is, or at least my religion is, that... Is that um, Let's take a living thing that is obviously living, it has identity, it strives for survival, it has independent life. And uh, I think that, that that's the point uh, behind mentioning a fly uh, uh, and, and, and another instance of a mosquito. Um, and the point is, bring this thing and, and try to make it. So now, by extrapolation to our modern time, if we look at something like uh, algae, for example, that has its independent life, or cyanobacteria, I don't think that even this challenge uh, can be met. Now, the, 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 the thing that, I'm not sure it was Jackson who said it or what, but um, should human beings be interested in actually creating biological robots? I, I, I think, think that's a different I, question. Yeah, Yeah, because, because you, you asked if, if well, no, what I said was, yeah, well, what I said was there's no reason to create like a fruit fly from scratch just for, for what? I mean, what, what would be the, I, what, what practical reason would there be for creating a, for like taking, you know, okay, oh, we know everything about a fruit fly and just say, and we're going to make it. Well, what would be the practical application of that? What would be the reason now for like a maybe, maybe like rapid cloning, maybe, maybe but of I guess. Then do it more well, but, yeah, you're gonna but more still, you would just do it. cloning. You know, you would just do yeah. cloning, right? But you, you wouldn't have to make it from scratch. Like with uh, with with like biotechnology, for instance, there has to be a reason for it. If you're if you're gonna clone something, then there's got to be a reason. Like you're cloning tissue to use for like grafting or something like that. But just creating organisms from scratch, I don't really see a point. I don't know I, why anyone would even go I for that. I actually think that you might I, run afoul of a lot of ethics boards if you tried that. I, I maybe I, would, I, but my, my, my point is that there's just no reason to do it. That's my point. I, I, I think the point behind it is, is, is not really that you, you're doing a fly here for utility. You're doing it to, to fulfill a challenge. But the, the guys who will be doing it to fulfill the challenge are obviously people who are interested to fulfill the challenge, to prove a point. I'm Yet not you sure any researchers are same. in that group, though. Yeah, yeah, no, it's like saying, yeah, like, can you make a, a space suit that works on the sun? Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe we could, but what would be the point? Yeah, you know? so well, I think one thing to remember is um, research scientists do not pay attention. Uh, maybe maybe to I just want to take a dive in the hot plasma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so, so one thing I think it's, it's important to note is... Um, this, this conversation about uh, creationism is not one that occurs in actual working science labs, uh, generally right. speaking. They actually, to be honest, creationism is, and I know that this, is, this, this isn't the nicest thing to say, but 
for your average scientist, creationism is on about the same level as Flat Earth. There is just no point to engaging with it. It's, it's mostly nonsense, uh, as far as most scientists are concerned. In fact, most scientists are not even aware that there are still people trying to get one over on evolution. So the idea that some scientists would conduct this study to try to create a fruit fly from scratch to no real benefit to themselves, to satisfy the curiosity or the challenge of people who are not really in the field is kind of, uh, let's say, far-fetched, that, that anyone would actually find the motivation to do that simply for that challenge. And I do also want to say we have a $2 super chat from Rodent, no last name, who says, once you invoke god magic, all arguments fail. He does have a question mark, so I'm going to go ahead and say, um, <laughs> that assuming, that's why I raised my voice at the end, assuming that by god magic we can reasonably say supernatural intervention, um, I would not actually say that all arguments fail. I think it is possible to construct an argument that would include supernatural agency that doesn't necessarily fail for the reason that it includes supernatural agency. Um, I don't have any off the top of my head, but I, it strikes me as unlikely that all of them would fail for that reason. And Jackson? I, I really don't even know how to respond to that. I, I'll pass it to whoever's next. Nestle? Nestle? Get on mute. Uh, I got no comment on that. Okay, to you, Lane. Uh, closing thoughts? No, no, no. This um, is the, to respond to that question, which I'm not entirely sure it was a question, but I had a question mark on it. I, uh, <laughs> again, I, I, uh, I, I've been kind of paying attention to chat because nobody else is. <laughs> so no comment. Yeah. No comment. Um, and so, uh, Ahmed, do you have any? Do you have an answer to the question? Once you invoke, and I'll just say, supernatural agency, all arguments fail. Uh, I think he's... No, it's... Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Science, 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 science will say, uh, we don't know. Uh, Theists will say, God did it. And the whole trick is that you are not saying God did it because it's a scientific gap. Uh, uh, my position on this will be, if you're asking me why uh, electricity happens, I will not say God did it. Because I have no theological reason to say that God is not using uh, a, a natural law to make this happen. But I would only say God did it in the things that God, in my religion, says explicitly that you will not find a naturalistic, a methodological naturalism derived uh, explanation for it. And, and these are the things, these, these things are very clear in scripture, in my scripture at least, and they are, uh, you can enumerate them. But just to go and invoke, invoke uh, God did it all the time is actually an, the antithesis of proving anything uh, about religion. So uh, I would say that if you choose God did it in the right things, uh, it, it shouldn't be a failed discussion because all what science will have to offer is I don't know. I will say, though, I could probably find some, uh, some philosophers in Islam who might disagree with you about God using natural laws. I, I think I think maybe the the person who asked the question was uh, pointed to was like uh, if you make the art like for example if, if somebody makes the argument the the light that we see from stars well God just snapped his fingers and uh, made made all the light go towards us so that we can see them and and enjoy them but of course when you go down that route then evidence becomes meaningless basically like uh, you know maybe maybe that's that's the point he was making. That might be. Um, I'm not sure. Um, at, and wrote a note last name. If you do want to clarify, if we didn't really address it, um, you can just add me. I will recognize that as part of your continued uh, support of the channel in terms of Super Chat, which has been very much appreciated. Um, so yeah, I do remember, um, we're probably only going to be up for a little bit less than a half an hour. So if you do have more questions for anyone on the panel, uh, please do let me know. Um, we should definitely, um, I, I would still be interested in, in like having a further discussion with you on the Cameron explosion if you want to do that at a later mm -hmm. date. So I would be interested in that happening too. Um, yeah. So why don't we work on setting that up uh, off the air. Um, we can try to get uh, Ahmed, you and Jackson in contact. And um, I'm sure that there are a number of channels that would be perfectly happy to host, including uh, Steve is probably willing to host. I certainly would be. Um, Modern Day Debate might be. So, you know, I'm sure that there's a number of uh, viable venues. Like, uh, 
Uh, also, also right. you, can, you can also recommend some video that, that you made, uh, Jackson, like uh, the, the, two, the two part video on the Cambrian Explosion and also Darwin's Confidence. I think it would be a good uh, like starter for uh, yep. Ahmed to catch up, basically, or what your position is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, we did, uh, yeah, Nestle, uh, Evil Grad, RJ, we all did a video, or we did two videos on uh, the Cambrian Explosions, parts one and two, which just kind of gives an overview on the prelude to the camera explosion and then the explosion itself and then we did a couple of videos which were a response to um this guy regarding the camera explosion and so we further elucidated some different parts about it uh which is called darwin's confidence and there's also another that. video about the pre-cambrian ancestors i think is it called oh yeah that's right yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, our pre-cambrian ancestors which was one we yeah. did where we just looked specifically at um uh life in the ediacaran and yeah, so. and all, and new fossils like uh, like there were there were some new fossils discovered about like, uh, but the uh, Precambrian bilaterians basically the yes, basically basically the relatives of everything that is bilaterally symmetrical the arthropods the the vertebrates the, the mollusks like uh, everything almost everything you can think of basically that it is not a sponge or a jellyfish <laughs> or right, a plant. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh -huh. we we have an an interesting point that was just made in a super chat by Patrick Dennis for two dollars who says, can't create, uh, or sorry, recreate a tornado either, must be supernatural. So I actually think that that grazes an interesting question. Um, so, <coughs> sorry, if the inability of uh, scientists to create a mosquito from scratch or, or a fruit fly from scratch or even a bacterium from scratch um, <clears throat> says something about the supernatural origin of life, does their inability to recreate a tornado say something about the supernatural origin of storm cells in the atmosphere? Mm -hmm. no. is, I, is that a question to me? I, yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. So it, it will not be a, a, a question about the supernatural uh, nature of tornadoes or of storm cells unless, uh, in my point of view, God says you cannot create tornadoes because then it is a religious assertion that tornadoes are forming in a supernatural way. But this kind of assertion is, is, is only available in few things, maybe if I if I count them, they will not be more than ten. And okay. Tornadoes is not one of them. So he... so it means it, 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 there is a specific verse in in, in in the Quran that 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 establishes that after the initial creation, God takes the throne. Um, the translation would be like that, but in Arabic it's not exactly that. But it, the translation would be like that. My explanation to this is, is that the throne means uh, um, uh, that it, it's like a king who has, you know, you have your kingdom and things are restless until, and until you establish your rule and then you sit on the throne. It means things are established. It means things will go mechanical from this point. So it means uh, that God, as part of his creation, established physical laws that are predictable. And the things that are still in our world today that need invocation of the supernatural, um, you can essentially say that it is the um, uh, uh, um, insertion of human souls because they bring in spe special creation for each single human being. Um, I cannot think of so many other things. And maybe if I think so hard, I, I would find one or two more things. But uh, earthquakes, uh, storms, uh, rain, etc., etc., the religious assertion there would be that you can find the laws that control them. But for something like the rain, for example, or some natural phenomena, you will find that God is reserving a place for prayers to intervene. I actually have a video about that, about how God might be intervening in the natural laws, and I'm using quantum mechanics as an entry point. Uh, collapse of wave function specifically and I like quantum mechanics because it's related to my background more mm. and 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 but it what it says is if you are totally unaware of anything except the natural world then you have to be stuck with the soul you have to be stuck with self-awareness and with free will this is a this is a clear assertion in religion but other things are Maybe some theologians in my religion will, will disagree, but I don't think they will have very strong grounds on it. <laughs> I so would be happy to debate any of that. This, this does bring up an interesting point, which is that, um, so one of the things you said was that 
whether or not humans can reproduce it is significant in terms of if you can find a place where God said that they couldn't. Um, yes. So, but does that not mean that in order to actually use this argument effectively against, or not against, but with someone who is not currently convinced by your position, that you would then have to convince them that your religion in particular is true, which actually seems like a, a higher hurdle than just convincing them that supernatural agency might be required in some instances in the natural world. I don't think that this is a requirement in my religion in particular. It might be a requirement in other religions. And the reason is that my religion acknowledges almost every other religion that has a supreme... Uh, um, a supreme uh, deity. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. uh, so I would acknowledge Yahweh, for example, as being the same as Allah. I would acknowledge God the Father as being the same. Probably Brahman is the same, etc. Maybe Odin is the same. And I would say that those religions had those extra partners introduced later by humans. And that the reason that one religion after one religion came um, is to recorrect the course. And I don't think that in any of those religions, you will find a religious assertion that free will and awareness and um, emotions, etc., which are grouped under the word soul, is a naturalistic process. You will not find that. Uh, in none of those religions, you will find, for example, that God does not intervene if you pray to him. So there is always this reservation that prayers work. So if, if, if I make those assertions, According to my religion, I think I will be just saying that God is in control and that he chooses ways that are predictable in the majority of phenomena. And he keeps his fingerprints in the historical events that has, have taken place, like the creation, uh, the, the initial spawning of the universe, what we call the Big Bang, maybe the creation of primordial stars, etc. Specific events that he specifically says that he has intervened in and uh, others that he says that he still continuously intervenes so that we can find him. So that somebody who is looking for God and wants to find something that he can feel can find him. And one of those things that I always refer to is our own being. We feel, we feel that we are not this body. And one of the assertions, like we cannot create life from scratch, is that we will not be able to explain our self-awareness and our, and our consciousness. It's impossible. And all the attempts have failed, regardless the so long attempts to reproduce it by calculation or by uh, whatever, artificial intelligence or whatever. What is, for example, claimed to be the upcoming singularity is a theological impossibility in my religion. Okay. We will not be able to recreate it. So we are, we are closing in on what, when we're ending it. There's a couple things I want to address. Um, one... Actually, three things. One is um, uh, Jungle Dragon said that uh, Africans aren't Semitic. I would like for you to go tell the people speaking uh, Ethiopic or Amharic that because uh, there are in fact a host of Semitic peoples in Africa. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the so. Simon Jews. Pretty yeah. neat history, actually. Yeah, there's, there's no. Some... He's saying Europeans are Semitic currently. Uh, well, no, he also said that Africans history. weren't, and the Af yeah. the Europeans are. I understand he has a video about that, so maybe I'll check that out. But um, we also have a question from Brian Stevens, which, um, I, so he, so I'm gonna read the question and I'm gonna say something after it. He says, "Do do people who believe in these other gods go to the best afterlife?" And I actually, I'm gonna say that um. I'm okay with a one-sentence answer to that, but I do not want to have a discussion on that because it is um, theology that doesn't, in my opinion, touch very much on science, which is something that I, I don't really talk about. If it, if it doesn't contradict the science, then I don't really particularly care what it is. But then we also have a, a, um, a super chat for $10 from Volander... Sorry about this. It's a very long name. A Volan, it might be Volan Dr. Uh, Ginger Gerson. I think I don't. Is it, I'm sorry, man, or 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 woman. I don't know. Um, I, I, I might be Volander Gingerson. I don't know. I'm not sure. But there's a ten dollars super chat that I'm going to read after we get that quick thing. Um, so, um, Ahmed, if you want to quickly, and by quickly I mean in like, you know, less a, a sentence or less, answer: Do people who believe in these other gods that you say are more or less the same as Allah? 
go to the best afterlife? People who believe in a God believe in an afterlife. That's a fact. Um, now, it depends if they find evidence that he has sent an overriding message and they deny it because of pride and prejudice that it will ruin their afterlife. Okay. And so uh, the, um, the super chat says, if supernatural things were real and part of existence, what keeps them from really just being natural or being beyond study or comprehension other than the claim by religious texts and proponents? And actually that is one of the more complicated um, philosophical discussions when it comes to uh, religion and how it relates to things like science is what actually is the distinction between natural and supernatural. So um, I think actually, I'd like to start with Ahmed and get what he thinks might be the distinction. Um, so is there a distinction between natural and supernatural? And if there is, how does, um, does that make the supernatural become beyond study or comprehension? And uh, yeah, what do, you, what do you think about that? If it's causal, it's natural. Okay, so anything causative is natural, including God? God causes things. God is uncaused. Okay, but does that mean that there isn't really a supernatural natural dichotomy? There is no dichotomy because everything natural is a product of the supernatural. It is a matter of agency. Whether God chooses to do some things directly, which makes them supernatural, or chooses to make them out of established causality that makes them natural in our perspective okay so there are certain um i'm trying to make sure that i get this so your position is that there are certain natural laws and if god causes things to happen according to those laws we can call it natural but if he were to suspend those for some reason and do something outside of them then it would be supernatural yes or whether he chooses that some things like consciousness or like our soul will not be explained at all by any natural law, not, not a matter of suspending. They, they, they just do not comply to these kinds of laws. They yeah. comply to their own laws. Which I mean, I actually, when pressed for definition for things like miracle or supernatural, that is actually pretty similar to what I tend to give. Um, the question then just becomes, do we have reliably observed such in instances? And uh, that's not a question I really care to get into. But does anyone have any um, other takes on what the dichotomy might be between natural and supernatural? Well, like a woman comment about like on cause, like I think if like the, the most common interpretation of quantum mechanics says like radioactive decay is on on cause, but I wouldn't consider that super supernatural if it's on cause. I I think about the dichotomy, like it it basically it basically becomes like what we know or uh, or can what can be known and cannot be known by the distinction. I I, I don't know how you can define it. Okay. Other than that, like, well, like, like, I mean, like, like, people, like when, maybe, when we didn't understood lightning, for example, then we considered it supernatural, but now we understood it, and now it becomes natural, basically. That's, 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 that's this distinction I make. So it's, it's, it's basically not an in, 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 inherent issue, it's just the way we look at things. Okay. All right, um, so I think that is it. And we are now pretty much coming up to the point where I'm going to start doing some wrap-up stuff. Um, so <clears throat> there is a guy on YouTube. This is just me doing some quick channel news, and then I'll ask everyone to give their outro and plug whatever they need to plug and then get out of here. So uh, for channel news, um, so let's see. Tuesday is Kent with Bent 52. Uh, then Thursday I will be premiering a video... Um, I'm not positive which one it will be. I think it might actually be a mirror of the creationist, a professional creationist tier list. So um, if you haven't seen that or you just want to watch it again and give my channel some views, uh, hop over there. If it's not that, it might be a video that I did about um, Answers in Genesis News, or I think they just call it Answers News, whatever. Then um, Saturday, I'm hoping that either this Saturday or the next one, I will be able to get a new uh, Leaving Young Earth Creationism with a guy named uh, Invoking Theism, who is on YouTube. Jackson, I know you know him. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> he seemed like he would be an interesting guest for that. So I have invited him onto that. And so um, I haven't heard back quite yet exactly whether or not he's okay with coming on that Saturday, but hopefully he will. And um, yeah, that's it. Make sure that you like this video. Uh, subscribe if you haven't. And. Um, 
follow me on Twitter, I guess. I have my... Speaking of which, right now my display name on Twitter is in Egyptian hieroglyphics, because I can. As you wow. Should. Yeah. I found out how wait, to do it, wait. so I was just like, you know what? I'm doing it. My display name on Twitter, Ever. Egyptian hieroglyphics. Excuse me. Dapper. Yes. Can you, make, can you uh, give me a translation for my name in hieroglyphics on Twitter? Yeah, you just have to, to tell me exactly how you want it. Do you like, want it transliterated? Do you want some kind of meaning translation? Something like that. But yeah, uh, I can... I can well, I'll, I'll let you know about that off, uh, off air. I, have my, I literally have my textbook on uh, Middle Egyptian grammar sitting within arm's reach of me right now. So, there you do, go. Do we know, do we know, do we know how our Egyptian was pronounced? Like, I don't kind know. of. So we have well-attested um, late period Coptic which is the last period in which the Egyptian language was a spoken language. And so we have some ability to recover um, vowel information from that. But the problem is that the farther back you go into the past, the harder it is to recover that. And also, um, Egyptian writing got a little bit weird, where um, it started to become not just archaic spellings, but in some cases kind of creative spellings. And so it's not always clear just how literally... Um, a spelling actually preserves pronunciation because for one thing we know that um the feminine ending in uh in egyptian which is actually cognate with the feminine ending in semitic languages was at which is um that's uh, essentially identical to the hebrew one and it's what the arabic uh feminine ending is when it is um when it precedes a suffix with a vowel so you know like um normally in arabic it's ah but if you put like the the first person singular possessive uh, suffix it becomes ati because that that has kind of been lost, which is why you write it with the two dots for a T. And so I think um, you should I think you should do a video about like the evolution of languages. Maybe do I should. a video of how, of how, of how, how, how I think Egypt is like related to like the uh, uh, Hebrew and uh, Arabic, right? So it is. So there. So the Semitic languages uh, are in a larger group called Afroasiatic, which includes yes. which includes the Egyptian language, which is closer to Semitic than it is to the other Afroasiatic languages, but also includes languages like Berber. So they form a super family. Yeah, it's like like also like the in, the Indo-European languages, like uh, yeah, uh, uh, everything in Europe and uh, some parts of uh, Asia are also related. Yeah, it's not really neat. So Egyptian isn't technically um, a Semitic language; it falls just no. outside that group. Yeah, it's sort of like um, there's some debate as to whether Luwian actually falls outside the Indo-European category. Uh, so yeah, it's one of those like it's almost there. It's transitional. It is basically <laughs> yeah, transitional. You can actually yeah. see. There are a lot of direct cognates in um, in uh, Egyptian to various Semitic languages, and it has a lot of similar grammatical features, like it features a triconsonantal root system, uh, enclitic pronouns for possession, uh, incorporation of pronouns into the verb to mark to double mark so both subject and object. All that stuff is stuff that you can find in Semitic languages, and that you will also find in uh, Egyptian. But anyway, to get back to the, the question about pronunciation, yeah, we can, mm -hmm. to some extent, recover pronunciation by using Coptic and uh, historical linguistic principles, but it's not 100%. And so now modern researchers who are working with hieroglyphics, they have a sort of standardized way to pronounce them that does not pay much attention to historical linguistics in terms of what, which way they would actually have been pronounced by real people speaking the language. So if you if you went back in time and tried to speak uh, Egyptian to like an actual Egyptian or ancient Egyptian, it would be like uh, an anime fan trying to speak Japanese. Yeah, you might be able to write a letter to, <laughs> yeah. one, to them. Yeah, but you wouldn't likely be able to actually talk to them, which is one of the things that's kind of unrealistic about the the Stargate movie. It's like I don't care how good your hieroglyphics are, if you went back to talk to ancient Egyptians, you would have trouble. Uh, your best bet would be to like find a scribe and try at, at, at best, to write at best you, would have, you, you would have a very thick accent at best. Oh, it would be worse than that. It would be, yeah, probably worse. Yeah. All right, so uh, Jackson, what do you have for your final comments? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, well, my channel, um, I have a couple of different videos that I'm thinking about doing one with you dapper uh maybe maybe hmm. uh i watched a couple of ahmed's videos and i was kind of thinking about maybe doing a response to one of those um uh a couple other which videos one? which are oh, i, I watched your video on evolutionary predictions can you hear me yeah he, i think he can he's just yeah. muted hello hello yeah. yep yeah he can hear oh i watched i watched your video on evolutionary predictions 
I referenced your video on, um, what is it, linguistics and epistemology, so I also watched that one. Um, yeah. So uh, those, are your, those are the only two videos of yours that I've actually watched, just those two. Yeah, they're um, all about linguistics and epistemology. Yeah, we may be doing a response the to the evolutionary predictions ones. Cause yeah. You, you okay. present very interesting information um, in some regards, and I, I don't know, but we'll see. Anyway. Um, uh, yeah, lots of other videos uh, that are secret, secret stuff. Secret, so, secret. Anyway. All right, and by the way, I, I know that, so I set this bit, this stream up pretty last minute because I, basically there was requests for an after show, so I was like, all right, I guess I'm doing an after show. So I don't have everyone's links or anything in here, but before this goes back up live, it will have links to everybody's channel, to the original debate and all that stuff. So, um... Sorry, whenever I do a, a last minute after show, the, the description is always the last thing to get fixed. So, um, Nestle, you got any last words for us? No, I, I think it was a very interesting conversation. All, all again, of, uh, of course, I don't, I don't have a lot of uh, agreement with Ahmed, but I think he's a very, a very uh, uh, cool guy to have a conversation with. Uh, oh, absolutely. Certainly, certainly in comparison to the uh, many of the other people <laughs> that we have talked to. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and one thing I, I like to recommend, like I, I have already recommended the book by Nick Lane, The Vital Question on Abiogenesis, but uh, I've also another video, another book uh, called uh, The Emergence of Life, or, or, or the, uh, uh, what's the title again? I, I also forget the full title. Um, the Emergence of the Fourth Geosphere. That's a, that's a subtitle. Oh, the origin and nature of life on Earth, the emergence of the fourth geosphere by Eric Smith and Harold Morowitz. It's a, ver it's a very technical book, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lots of lots of information on it. Okay. Yes. All right, TD Lane, what do you got for us? Uh, nothing much. I've been kind of useless throughout this uh, talk, but I've enjoyed uh, hearing Jackson and Ahmed talk. I think this has been quite a fun after show. I agree. I've, I've had a lot of fun with it. Actually, I do have one thing, Dapper. Uh -oh. The entire chat and all your fans need to ensure to uh, shame you for continuing to have the pile of the shame with the uh, Alpha Legion not being finished. Yeah, look, uh, I don't have an excuse, so there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I actually, I was, I was thinking the other day, like, um, what lighting setup should I use? Because I just moved. And, like, where, what would be the place for light and whatnot and I have a few options um, one is even outside and I'm not sure which one would be best so I am I'm reassessing where I should do painting and whatnot but my paints are are here I did bring them I brought the models so but uh last but certainly not least the other person in the debate Ahmed what do you got for us well, number one, thank you for having me on this panel, uh, Dapper. It's a uh, nice gesture. So um, thanks course. for everybody who had uh, said uh, really nice comments. Uh, I enjoyed uh, chatting with you guys. I think that uh, the, 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 the discontinuity between um, people who take on the uh, evolutionary line of thought and those who take the creation line of thought needs to have... Uh, much more dialogue in a peaceful and respectful manner and so does people who uh, do not believe in God or are agnostic and people who are believing in God and people who believe in God but on different religions. I think if we can make plenty of those discussions things will get much more uh, much 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 more better. Okay. For sure. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, well so thank you very much. For a nice discussion. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had a, I had a great time uh, both during the debate and the after show, and uh, I hope I will see everyone here for um, Kent with Bent on Tuesday. So goodbye, everyone, and have a wonderful whatever day it is. I think for some people it's probably going to be Monday already, but I think for most of the world it's still Sunday or wait Saturday. Yeah, Saturday. <laughs> I I don't even know what time. <laughs>